The story that you are about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts, featuring characters, events, or places that has played a role in shaping history. Please sit back and listen as I recite this narrative for you. Natasha Garnett is a self-described Satan worshiper serving three life sentences for the shooting deaths of a Knoxville couple and their six-year-old daughter. Cornette and other Kentucky teenagers encountered the Lillilid family at a rest stop near Greenville, Tennessee in 1997. The couple's two-year-old son also was shot, but he lived. Natasha Cornette was born into poverty on January 26, 1979 in rural Pike County located in eastern Kentucky. Cornette's mother, Madonna Wallen, was not married to her biological father, a local policeman named Roger Burgess, with whom Madonna was having an affair. When Natasha was a toddler, Madonna left her husband, Ed Wallen, and raised Natasha alone as a single mother in a ramshackle trailer located in the outskirts of Pikeville, Kentucky. It is believed Natasha received little or no parental support, financial or social, from either her biological father or Madonna's ex-husband, whose name had been entered on her birth certificate. According to Tennessee court records, she grew up with the lack of a father figure and an irresponsible mother. By junior high school, Cornette was alienated from most of her fellow pupils because of her unconventional behavior. She suffered from anorexia and was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which went largely untreated due to lack of health insurance. By the time she entered high school, Cornette was being openly harassed and bullied by other students for her uncommon dress and conduct. Pleas for help by her were ignored by unsympathetic school authorities. Sometime during her freshman year of high school, Cornette dropped out. Cornette married a longtime friend named Stephen Cornette on her 17th birthday, but the marriage was short-lived. Stephen ended the marriage after six months. Natasha wouldn't let her husband leave home to go to work some mornings, threatening to kill herself if he did. She had stopped drinking and using all drugs because she wanted to get pregnant. She thought that having a baby would heal all her pain. After the divorce, Natasha caved in emotionally and was psychologically devastated. She also indicated this failed relationship exacerbated her existing mental health problems. Cornette had embraced the goth subculture manner of black clothing and dark doom ridden music, as well as exhibiting interest in the occult and witchcraft. Also, at this time, Cornette was abusing drugs and alcohol and practicing self-mutilation all of which she had been doing since her early teen years. Young people similarly inclined were drawn to Cornette and she became the informal leader of the group. On April 4, 1997, during a Friday night party of drinking beer and getting high in a room at the Cali Hotel in Pikeville, Kentucky, Natasha told friends she wanted to go back to New Orleans and dreamed of leaving out one of her favorite movies, Natural Born Killers, a movie about a pair of lovers who leave a trail of bodies on their way to the Mexican border. Most of the people in the room had known each other since at least high school, staying on and off with Cornette at her mother's trailer. Karen Howell, a friend Cornette called her soulmate, shared a fascination with the occult and stories of childhood visions and sexual abuse. Dean Mullins was dating Cornette. Joe Risner had dated Cornette and now Howell. Crystal Sturgill, a newcomer who was no longer welcome in her home after reporting her stepfather for sexual abuse, had found a home with Cornette. Jason Bryant, the youngest of the group at 14 years old, had been on probation as a runaway when Cornette picked him up from a street corner, offering him cheap bourbon and kisses. He routinely lied about his age and even let Cornette carve her initials into his arm to show that he wasn't afraid. On April 6, 1997, 
Natasha Cornett, Edward Dean Mullins, 19 years old, Joseph Lance Risner, 20 years old, Crystal Sturgill, 18 years old, Jason Blake Bryant, 14 years old, and Karen R. Howell, 17 years old, all decided to hit the road to leave the boredom, poverty, and general unhappiness of life in Pikeville. The gang was hoping to start a new life in New Orleans, Louisiana, and Risner, who was the oldest of the group, was on spring break from the local tech center where he'd been taking trade classes after earning his GED. He had a car, a Chevrolet Citation registered in his mother's name. The group had stolen two guns, a 9mm and a 25 caliber, and some cash before leaving Kentucky. By chance, they met the Lililid family at an interstate highway rest area in Greenville, Tennessee. Norway-born Vidar Lililid, 34 years old, his American wife Delfina, 28 years old, their daughter Tabitha, 6 years old, and son Peter, 2 years old, were Jehovah's Witnesses, hoping to convert the troubled youths. They were headed home from a religious convention but stopped at the rest area on Interstate 81 South at just the right time to cross paths with six Kentucky youths on the run from the police, parents, and a community they hated. Cornette and her friends wanted to steal the family's van, a cream-colored 1987 Dodge. Having already discussed possibly carjacking a bigger and more dependable vehicle to replace their cramped and likely unreliable citation. At gunpoint, the family was forced back into their van and ordered to drive to a deserted road in nearby Baileyton, Tennessee, where they were shot execution style by 14 year old Jason Bryant and possibly other male members of the group. Later court testimony differs on which other male members of the group participated in the shooting. After the shooting, the group abandoned their own vehicle and left in the Lililid's family's van. As a result of the murders, the group changed their plans, deciding to flee to Mexico instead of going to New Orleans. Soon after they drove off, police found Vidar and Delfina dead at the scene. Tabitha died after being transported to the hospital. Peter, who was found lying in a ditch, was the only survivor. He had been shot once in the torso and once through the eye. As a result of the shooting, he was left blind in one eye and has spinal cord damage. He now lives in Sweden with his paternal aunt. An autopsy by Dr. Cleland Blake determined the family had been lined up along the ditch and shot with Vidar Lililid most likely the first to fall. The parents had been not only shot but run over, with Delfina Lililid probably alive when the stolen van rolled over her. One shot, probably the first, struck the father in the right eye and would have knocked him unconscious immediately. He landed on his back to be shot at least four more times. Three shots all from a 9mm pistol formed a nearly perfect triangle on his right upper chest a pattern that could only have been intentional. Two more shots, one from a 9mm and one from a 25 caliber pistol, had pierced his chest below the right nipple. Delfina Lililid had most likely been shot first in the left arm by the 9mm. The second bullet struck her in the left leg and shattered her thigh bone, bringing her to the ground. Neither wound would have been fatal, and the mother lived to be shot six more times. On the left side of her abdomen, Blake found another triangle of gunshot wound, almost identical to the pattern on her husband's chest and from the same caliber of bullet. A gunshot to the middle of her abdomen by the 9mm and two more in the left chest and abdomen from the 25 caliber rounded out the list of wounds. Blake estimated she could have lived as long as half an hour, long enough to see her husband and both her children shot. Tabitha had been shot once in the head by a small caliber bullet. Peter had been shot twice, once in the head behind his right ear and out of his right eye, and once in the back, both from a small caliber gun. Two days after the shootings, Cornette and the five others in the Lilliland family's stolen van were taken into custody by U.S. Customs and Immigration officials in Arizona 
after Mexican police ordered them to return to the United States for entering Mexico without proper papers. Natasha and the others were transported to Greenville, Tennessee, where they were booked into the local county jail awaiting trial on charges of first-degree murder, attempted murder, and kidnapping. Cornette accepted the volunteered pro bono legal services of attorney Eric C. Kahn, a lawyer specializing in social security disability cases, not criminal defense. At Kahn's instruction, Natasha made public statements in which she called herself the daughter of Satan and claimed involvement with devil worship in preparation for an insanity defense. She also claimed that Satan would help her and urge other youths to raise hell while they can before the world ended. The judge overseeing the trial felt that this was not in the best interests of the defendant, so he ordered Con removed and replaced before the trial started. Cornette later said she made the statements at the advice of her attorney. The trial began and proceeded, but before the case could go to the jury, the district attorney, Berkeley Bell, decided to offer a deal to the defendants, plead guilty and receive life without parole instead of risking execution if the jury found them guilty and then imposed the death penalty. On March 13, 1998, Natasha and her co-defendants pleaded guilty to all charges against them, thereby avoiding the possible death sentences for her and the three others who were 18 years old or older. Due to their status as minors, Howell and Bryant were already ineligible for the death penalty, but they accepted the deal on advice from the council. All of the perpetrators had difficult childhoods and lived on the edge of the law. Although Natasha took the plea bargain, court testimony established that she did not do the actual shooting of the four victims. During her own testimony, Cornette claimed she tried unsuccessfully to prevent the deaths. In accordance with the agreement she had entered into, Natasha received three sentences of life without the possibility of parole and two additional sentences of 25 years, one each for attempted murder and kidnapping. Since her arrival at the prison in Nashville, Cornette has earned her GED and a certification in cosmetology. In a 2007 article published in the Knoxville News, Madonna Wallen stated that her daughter serves as a mentor for some fellow inmates as they work to earn their GEDs. On August 24, 2001, Cornette and death row inmate Krista Pike allegedly attacked fellow prisoner Patricia Jones after Jones attempted to attack Cornette from behind. Jones was nearly strangled to death with a shoelace by Pike in retaliation after Pike and Jones were placed in a holding cell with Cornette during a fire alarm. Although the Department of Corrections believed that Cornette was involved, investigators found insufficient evidence to charge her with helping Pike, who was subsequently found guilty of attempted murder. Hey everyone, I just wanted to express how grateful I am that you took the time to listen to my narration. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I am Twisted Mind and please enjoy the rest of your day. Salamat.